Mike Gretz. Yes, Joe. How are you? I'm great. PJ. I'm great. My man. Man, it's great to be here. It's great to see you. Back uh, in the old hood, you know. Yeah. Prospect Park, baby. <laughs> it's so funny. I just found this out. And, yeah. and I think that would just be a great place to start. Literally across the street from Marty McGee's, which yeah. used to be Naz's place, yeah, was, yeah. was Delco Beverage. Delco Beverage. Yeah. It wasn't the first home of, of Delco. Okay. Um, back in 1954, my dad left the family brewery. Uh, the William Gretz Brewing Company in Philadelphia. And he went to Chester, PA. Back when Chester, PA yep. was a, uh, you know, booming yeah, boom town. town yeah. He had a little garage and he had a couple brands uh, that he represented, one being Gretz Beer and another being uh, Anheuser-Busch. Uh, and one of those two ended up being something uh, important. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, you know, this was a, a really... An amazing story, uh, and I, I would actually start back in the 1800s because we had a yeah, you know, yeah. my great grand excuse me <clears throat> my great grandfather um, came over as an immigrant, and all he knew was brewing. He was a brewmaster from Germany, had no money, and ended up here with a guy who uh, believed in him, a, a guy named Rieger, and it became Rieger and Gretz uh, Brewing in, wow. in Philadelphia. So the one's the banker, the other's a brewer, and that went all the way to Prohibition. And wow. uh, the banker cut out after Prohibition. <laughs> <laughs> Smart guy. Uh, but my uh, then grandfather uh, became uh, became the head brewer, and, and uh, he and his brother were working uh, the William Gretz Brewing Company. And that was all the way up to 1962, when when you know in in that time the consolidation was happening. You know you had, uh, and it's amazing the pattern. We can talk about that uh, how the cycle. Mm. of brewing you know it was it was very parochial there was a brewery on every street um you, you drank your your own town for sure, sure. But you drank your own block in a lot of cases because right wow beer didn't travel well then you know it wasn't pasteurized right. so you really buckets of beer and go down and pour a bucket and take it home if you want or or at the at the um at the pub but uh for the you know for that period of time Kratz beer was what a big regional a pretty big regional uh, brewery. And then the big guys come in, uh, Anheuser-Busch being one that was very uh, significant in the transition of the beer industry. That, uh, you know, they, they'd they have companies come in and, and Heilman being a big one that would buy up regional brands to try to stay afloat. Um, and uh, brands like Schmitz and Ortlibs, you know, sure. brewery, 62 breweries in Philadelphia at, wow. at their peak. So and, that, that, and that was Brewery Town, right? As we, well, you know. Philadelphia. No, the Brewery Town was a section oh, okay. of, of right. uh, Philadelphia, just because there were a number of breweries sure. in there. But right. you know, uh, Ortlieb's and Schmidt's, uh, you know, Northern Liberties is really yeah. part of it. Right. But Gretz Beer was in uh, Kensington, mm -hmm. so um, you know the, the transition was pretty dramatic. You went from these small regionals to, or even small, just small locals, to the big nationals. I think my dad saw that handwriting on the wall. He left the brewery in 54 and, and actually, you know, this is one of our connections with PJ, which right. I love, Yeah, that it was the same month that my yeah. dad left the family brewery and your grandfather was the, it was the beginning yes. of Dolan's, Dolan's bar. I remember my, my father saying that I, one of the reasons being was that they were able to package a six pack and a draft beer for, you know, a decent amount or whatever it was that, that was affordable for the average Joe to come in and get. And that's yeah. the reason why they jumped on board with it. Yeah. 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 Really, wow. really amazing. So great history. Yeah. You know? um, but, you know, with with Gretz beer, uh, 1962, it sold. But dad leaving in 54, he went to Chester and then he outgrew that. He started, you know, getting getting on his feet because it was a few tough years. Sure. Just trying to get enough sales. So he moves to, uh, to Prospect Park right here. And uh, it's wild. We spent, uh, well, I, that's where I, when I got out of college, I went right into into work. And uh, yeah, we spent a lot of nights in Naz's place. And you know, <laughs> it's like, it's such a different world. You know, yeah. you finish work, you're going to a bar, you know, and, and we'd only do that after we'd have a few beers on the, on the ramp. Nice. As the trains come in and you're, you know, watching everybody get off. Nice. Wow. <laughs> so what, 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 was that back where, uh, just, just uh, on the corner there? If it right along the tracks, um, okay, I know the building. There's uh, just a. It's really not even that big, but it's uh, just an old warehouse. Yep, and no, uh, well. cinder block built. Yep, uh, we did uh, two expansions on that. One in the front, one in the back, 
and then uh, finally moved down to Aston in uh, you know early 80s. Uh, I had a big uh, spot down there, and then um, the uh, you know I could tell you a little bit about my history because you know I tell yeah, people sure. I spent 65 years in the beer business, you know, and uh, yeah, PJ's yeah. like, wow, I get it. You're looking pretty yeah. good for an 85 year old, <laughs> or maybe you're not thinking that. No. <laughs> so, uh, it, which is for the most part true, but I had a little bit of an interruption. 1990, I actually got in the snack food business with Eagle Snacks. Oh, okay. And uh, food distribution mm -hmm. was our uh, a, a secondary business for us, but we were a tri-state, fairly large tri-state snack food distributor, Eagle Snacks, and famous Amos uh, cookies and sure. Reisman pretzels and you know all kinds of things. So we had we had fun. It was a, a diversion from the beer business. And then in um, you know in 1996, uh, my brothers and I bought a company called Morabli Beverage up in Norristown. Okay. And Morabli was really twice our size. Uh, another Anheuser Busch distributor with a lot of other brands as well. Mm. So it was a good fit. And we went up to so we went from Aston to Norristown. And then about uh, seven years ago, we went, uh, we were just totally outgrew that building. We had one up at Doylestown as well. And then we bought a, ha uh, a warehouse, uh, 340,000 square feet up in Hatfield. So that's where we were when we sold uh, in 18 to Penn Distributors, which is the Anheuser-Busch sure. wholesaler in, in Philadelphia. And they, uh, they bought us out. So right, what, what, can you tell us a little bit, you know, so you, you had Delco, it was a Delco, Delco beer. beverage. Delco, Delco, Delco beverage. beverage. Yeah. Yep. So that was, you know, a mom and pop. Uh, I'm guessing D license, Pennsylvania uh, ID, D license. ID, yep. ID license. ID license. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, how do you go from that to negotiating exclusivity with brands to then distribute at like the next scale up? What? What? Can you just talk a little bit about that transition or yeah. how that happened? Was that well, a timing thing or? It was. It's always timing. Sure. You right. know, it really is. And and uh, we happen to be very close to the Mirabli family. Uh, you know, the, again, another generational sure. thing, you know, they were second generation. There was four brothers and two sisters, you know, and it was really, and they didn't have any next generation coming in. So they were all a little older and uh, they liked the way we did business and said, hey, we're, um, we're going to sell our business. We're going to sell it to you. And it uh, sounds great. And then, then they dropped the bomb us saying, and this is what you're going to pay. <laughs> 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 all right which meant we were in debt for a, a mm -hmm. long time, but it was a really something that you either, you know, you either grow or you go. And a lot of businesses yep. are like that. You, you've got to get scale. You've got to be bigger. Um, and then the tricky part is with a company like Anheuser-Busch, you've got to get their blessing. You know, nobody can, right. not just anybody can be an Anheuser-Busch wholesaler. A lot of sure. very strict standards and and uh we had, it, just the fact that you're a wholesaler doesn't immediately qualify you to get another territory right you've right. got to you know pass their their test and oh wow really kind of uh meet the criteria of saying hey we've got a new territory here who's the management team what are you going to do how are you going to grow the brands what's the investment yeah they don't want you uh, dropping the ball what's that they don't want you dropping the ball no it's yeah. it's really uh you know important for them and and they don't want they can't afford a failure you know they don't want a wholesaler get overextended and not be able to pay the bills so they look at the financials and say okay give it the blessing and and you got it so um yeah it's it's really it was really the the move that secured our future you know that 1996 and my dad um lord rest his soul you know he, he was a smart guy good businessman at, and he was at the age where he said you know this is really great opportunity for you but I'm not interested in debt. So you sure. guys got it. You know, you got my blessing, make something of it. And, right. uh, you know, he was always the honorary chairman. You know, he was a, a, a great guy, very obviously influential for me. Yeah. Uh, great, a great beer guy. Everybody loved him. Yeah, yeah. he he was. Great uh, smile. Great smile. Yeah. Always had a, you know, um, a quick joke for you. You know, he loved his Irish jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he was one of those guys who could walk in any bar and immediately pick up a, a you know a conversation with anybody about anything you sure. know so it's like the ultimate uh, beer guy you know sure. being be able to walk in and and connect uh and it is a you know it's a people business so yeah absolutely. It is. yeah 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 i always say it's not rocket science you know if you're if you're serving cold beer in in a in a, in a comfortable bar yeah. and you treat people right i mean yeah there's, 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 I know there's a lot of other things to it, like pricing and costing and <laughs> yeah. buying it right, right? I always say I never buy, I'll never pay, I'll, I'll never pay market rate for a bar. 
<laughs> I'm 40 percent below market all day, or I'm not touching it. <laughs> I'd rather turn you know turn something like that around. But yeah. but I, I believe that it's just treating people right and showing them a good time and and truly just being um, you know a person of hospitality. We talked a lot about you mentioned Anheuser Busch and, mm. and and their I guess philosophy of looking at. Um, you know, this business is kind of making friends. Yeah. Um, you know, it sounds like you talked a little bit about that, but I guess in your experience on the distributor side, like what was your philosophy that was, that, that enabled you, y your company to grow at, at the clip that you guys did? Well, look, I look at the people that were influential in my life and you know, the term making friends is our business was coined by Gussie Bush. You know, right. one of the iconic people in the beer business, a personality, a larger than life guy. Um, incredible, incredible uh, uh, person lived this amazing life, but he never forgot. It, it's the customer, the consumer that makes you, you know? So it was always something that you you knew that it starts with the consumer. Sure. Don't ever forget it. You know, right. if that person's Absolutely. not buying your beer, yeah, you have no chance. I don't care what else it is, you know? So he really right. got that. Um, you know, for me, I think that, um, there, there's a lot of things that you say, okay, there's cliches all day long. You know, it's, it's um, you know, harder where I work, the luckier I get, you know, but yeah. I think this industry truly is built on, you know, the foundation customer service without a doubt. Yep, true. But it is about hard work. You know, I think that you're dealing with, for the most part, bar owners are hardworking mm -hmm. people. You know, I'm, yeah. you know, you, you work your tail off. And when you walk in, and I remember this one story, this kind of anecdotal story about uh, when we bought the Mirabilis and, you know, I, I was out of business school and I, you know, get into my dad's business and it was the way he was running it. And it's okay, I've got a couple of things I'd like to do and build it and all that. And then a few years later, you're buying another company that had their culture. Mm. It's the first time I stepped into something. I said, well, it's not everybody doesn't have the same values, right? And I remember walking, I did a lot of ride with, with uh, you know, we call them ride whist when you're with the sales rep. Sure. And, going out the bars and uh, this one guy kind of young but he had been with the company for a number of years he walks into the bar and he imagine this you're a bar owner right and you're in the back room and the bartender's up front and the guy says is the owner here to the bartender <laughs> I'm like, oh man <laughs> uh, and the guy says uh yeah yeah he's back there you know there go on back i get outside and i said you know you really had to have just pissed off that guy Right. You totally disrespected him. And that's the guy that pours your beer. Right, right, right. right, right. The owner puts it in. He buys it. Great point. But this guy, this guy pours it. Don't ever walk into a bar. You know, these are some of the fundamental things of saying, you know, that guy's been working really hard all day long. And you walk in and you don't even recognize him. You don't call him by his name. So I said, here's your challenge. I want you to learn every bartender's name i want to i want you to know the chef's name because yep. he probably has a little something to say about it and of course the owners and managers sure but sure. you know those are things that you say the, the foundation of this beer industry is built on hard work mm -hmm. sweat equity um it's built on people doing exactly what you said you're going and sitting at uh, you know knowing the customer knowing how knowing a product they're putting out knowing the right price knowing the right you know, if it's food, it's the right food and how to price it and homemade, you know, homemade products or whatever sure, it might be. Sure. So, um, you know, those are some of the things that are understanding the retailer. Um, and you don't understand the consumer until you're actually out among the, the consumer. You want to talk to somebody about what they think about your beer, what they think about what other beers are in the market, why they're drinking a competitive beer. Right. right. Those are really important insights you sure. get. So those are those are the external factors, you know, the retailer and the customer and the and the consumer, and then internally, you know, it is about your team. You know, you don't do any. If you think you're doing it yourself, you're not right. going to be successful. Right. You know, there is no one man show. Um, what you can do is this. You know, the the typical leadership profiles of saying, "I'm going to," you know, it's the you know, the, you know, how do you define a leader? You know, be a good leader. Well, what's that mean? You know, it's, it means things to different people, but I think there's some things that you could say are relevant to everybody, sure. right? Again, a little bit cliche-ish, but lead by example. Mm -hmm. To me, it was, you know, a good leader is one that shows and, and clarifies where it is you want to be. What is it we're trying to achieve and why? 
Why is it good for the consumer? Why is it good for the retailer? Why is it good for you as a sales rep? Why is it good for the company? And why is it good for the brewer? Be clear about it. What are the goals? And how are we going to get there? You know, if you do that, you typically have people jumping on board. I know where we're going. Right. Then you say, okay, it's about educate, you know, teach people how to do it, right? Motivate, give them a reason to do it. So it could be incentives or, or whatever, and then celebrate. I, you know, if you do something and you, everybody does it, go out and have a beer. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. like, yeah, celebrate on. it. Yeah. <laughs> and we did a lot of that. And mm-hmm. Sometimes you, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> you're, you're drowning your sorrows too. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't get it, we're still having a beer. Right, right. So, uh, you know, I really think beer has been such a, uh, you know, it's a remarkable industry. Let's it face is. It. It's, it is, uh, you know, I was born into it, but, uh, you know, I've known nothing else, but I wouldn't want to know really anything else. Yeah. There's, in terms of spending my life in a business, I can't imagine anything, anything better. Beer is remarkable. And, you know, you think about this world today. Hey, you know what? Maybe what we need is a beer together, right? Just yeah. grab a beer. True. Grab well, a beer. Go to the bar. Have a, have a, you know, beer with a neighbor. You know, meet somebody. Talk to them and have a beer. You, uh, I've seen you in action in the bar room. And um, you, you are one of those people, and uh, I'm sure it's a credit to your, your father and your lineage, where you do talk to everybody that's in the bar and make them feel like they're the most important person in the room. But we were going back to um, the, the old adage that, that the bar room was a community at one point. Yeah. You know, you, you could walk into, if, you, if you were moving into a town, right? Yeah. You know, what would you do? The first thing you go into the Irish bar, because, yeah. you know, you're going to meet your plumber, you're going to meet the, <laughs> the mayor, you know. And, uh, you know, just, just how you operate, and, you know, I've seen it firsthand, uh, it, it's remarkable. Could you speak a little bit on how, how it is now compared to what it used to be with, with that community aspect of the bar room? Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> you know it because you live it and you've seen it in generational. Uh, it's remarkable. And it, look, you could go back to the early days, you know, and what a tavern represented to the community. It was where, I mean, right here in this city, you know, we've got the Constitution written at City Tavern. Yeah. You know, a bunch of guys drinking beer and brainstorming. Yep. Came up with the Constitution. Pretty, pretty damn cool. The Marines were founded in Tun Tavern, ton, right? ton yeah. Tavern yeah. in yeah. Philadelphia. So remarkable history that goes back and just identifies that taverns were the core. That was the community center. You know, it was the, the place where people would just go and meet and talk. And, and uh, you know, uh, that's where ideas were shared. Uh, principles were, you know, sure. Uh, beliefs were kind of set in stone, you know, you talk about started. something, yeah. revolution started, <laughs> um, you know, pretty amazing. And, and then you get to modern, you know, not modern times. So let's take it up to prohibition. And, you know, shit got out of hand. Let's say, you know, it was, <laughs> you had people, you know, controlling, uh, controlling the tavern owners that were not, you know, the, you know, there was a author, uh, Damon Runyon, you know, he um, wrote, he wrote about, Badass guys, yeah. right? The you know, mob. you wrote about all around here. What's that? Oh, he grabbed yeah. all of his characters from it, this area. So there's, there, you read about those characters, mm-hmm. and it's okay, that was pre prohibition. It was not good. Right. And uh, of course, the uh, 13 years of prohibition mm-hmm. and then the 21st Amendment with a whole bunch of rules. How do we stop that from happening again? So you have things like state controlled law. So the state controls it, Pennsylvania being a Quaker state very conservative liquor law. Sure. People say, how did we get to this point in our state? Well, right. you, know, we're, you know, their founding fathers were Quaker and the rate, the, you know, a lot of those people wrote the rules that we live by today. But, you know, other things that were national were separation of tiers. You know, you, you don't have a brewer, uh, you know, controlling the tavern. Sure. Uh, back in Europe, they're called tide houses. So Guinness right, is the right. largest tavern owner uh in the world thousands of taverns that they own and uh you know in in this country it would be called the free house you know you can do whatever you want put whatever you want on tap nobody can control your business and typically there's uh rules requiring that there to be an intermediary which is the which is what we were the importing distributor the wholesaler right representing the brands and in turn selling selling to the tavern so you know, kind of eliminating undue influence. You know, you, you can't have a society where uh, shelf space is purchased. You know, that's illegal. So, right. you know, if somebody comes in and says, I've got more money than the other guy, I give you a thousand bucks for all your taps. You know, you can just pour my beer. It's illegal. Mm-hmm. So those were all post-prohibition. 
And in, as far as the taverns go, you know, it really started this generation of, um, you know, individual, family owned. Uh, you know, they, they had to connect to the consumer. They had to have a relevance, a purpose for being. So whether it was a good price or good food or good location, whatever it was, um, that dominated the industry. And for years and years, it was really uh, very, very conservative in Pennsylvania. The laws were very strict on how you could promote beer. You couldn't advertise. Right, right. <laughs> you weren't allowed to advertise. You couldn't put a sign in the front window saying, I've got draft for sale for 25 cents or 10 cents or five cents. Really? Illegal. If you could see a price from the exterior, That's right. it was illegal. So, you know, over time, Pennsylvania started softening some of the marketing rules and, and uh, became, a, you know, a little more friendly to, sure. to marketing and sales. Um, and, you know, when I got in in the late 70s, the market is controlled by, um, you know, it was probably 60 percent uh, tavern on premise, as we call it, and 40 percent off premise. Well, that number is really flipped in the oh. in the last, you know, 40 plus years. Sure. But back then it was they were small tavern owners. And that was really the 70s and 80s, you know, and some very, very successful uh, operators, you know, they, and you know, I think about locally, Del mm -hmm. you know, Delco had a lot of them that sure. were really great, and that iconic them, the, you know, the Iaconas, yeah. the Hennessy's, you know, sure. the Dolans, yeah. right? The, Donna, the Cooks, yeah. the Donna, yeah. well, he was the son-in-law of Jack Duke, a very right. successful guy. So, Which just sold, by the way. Was it really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, so, you know, there's these iconic guys that, that built their businesses um, with hard work, business knowledge. Uh, you know, they, they just knew how to uh, operate a business. They're very, very good operators. And, uh, you know, then he kind of shifted into the, into the late 80s and 90s, became more of a club atmosphere, mm -hmm. some, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the Lagoon would have been one where Bill Cook goes and, you know, takes a sleepy little restaurant. The into the, lights, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. And it created a nightclub. But that was a period of time that clubs really ruled, you know, the market. Very, very influential for beer brand, uh, building, uh, building beer brands. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you know, you also had a guy, a few guys that were uh, – taking it to the next level. They wouldn't be chains, but they would be small. Um, you know, I think about uh, Steve Graham, you know, with Casey's Ale House or Bill Daly sure. with, you know, uh, or the Hampshire's with, with Great American Pub, Bill right. Daly with Barnaby's. Mm -hmm. So they take a concept and have multiple locations, giving them scale. And, you know, it was kind of like, all right, that's the local chain. And I mean, if you're talking about things that were really influential in changing the, the beer world, uh, I think there's kind of five things that really changed Delco land, landscape. And, and the first was the, a little bit of, of the working class uh, person. You know, this, the waterfront, when I first got in, the waterfront was thriving with thousands of workers at Westinghouse and Sunship and, right. you know, the refinery and all these places. And they were working around the clock. Yeah. So when I first started, you know, night happy hour was at 8 o'clock in the morning. You know, they're off, they're off their shift and they're going to drink. So the That's bars were, point. bars were going from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. Um, it was, it was unbelievable. But beyond that, you get into, you know, the chain, you know, the chain account. It's people, oh, there's chains all over. Well, when I started, there weren't chains. There was, uh, the first chain was Holohan's in Springfield. And it was a huge success, but it's the only chain we had in, Del in Delaware County. Um, I think that another one, a huge shift, uh, and it happens over time. But you look at it now, and you, can you imagine this market without Wawa and their their hoagie and the you know the sure. fast food going in and grabbing it? Yep. That was never done, especially after the bar. <laughs> after the bar, <laughs> going at two a.m. at Wawa right. is very busy, yeah. right? Yeah. But you're right. That grab and go was that was non-existent. That was non-existent. Yeah. So you look at it, and that was you know before Wawa, that lunch was happening in a bar. You'd go into a bar, you'd have a beer and a sandwich, you know, and uh, and that really kind of, you know, speaks to the, you know, the next uh, item, which is 0.08, you know, and, and alcohol was, was uh, you're just such a, a prevalent uh, part of our society uh, at any time. You know, you, you go and have it at eight o'clock in the morning. It's time. I've finished my work. I, I don't care what the clock says. I'm finished work. I'm having a beer. Right. You go to lunch, you're having a beer. 
uh, and and more than one. You know, you're you're having a few. Uh, I remember when I first started. <laughs> this is embarrassing, but you know, in the in the day, it's like uh, that's the way things happen. When I first started, our warehouse guys would be driving a forklift, <laughs> drinking a beer, <laughs> and I'm like, Bad. you know. <laughs> it's, I'm, it's like an OSHA commercial. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, you know, I got, maybe, maybe we, uh, hold off until after work <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we change it. It was not popular, but you know, it's okay. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. Even Anheuser Bush back in the day, guys would drink at work and, um, their union. And I think it's even this way today for Anheuser Bush. If you're an Anheuser Bush employee, uh, when Anheuser Bush stopped that where you couldn't drink during the work day. The union negotiated, well, then you, where's our free beer? You uh, took something away. So they would get a free case of beer. I don't know if it was every week or every month, but <laughs> since we're not giving it to you while you're working, you take one when you leave, take a case, you know, and uh, that was the union negotiation for Anheuser Bush. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the, the fifth thing that is uh, that we all take for granted right now, but it was really not in place uh, uh, even just a number of years ago, the in, in home entertainment, you know, cable TV, you know, you have get, you got so many entertainment options today that weren't around, you know, so to sit at home and watch on demand movies or, right. you know, to play video games or things that keep you at home versus back in the day, not that long ago, if you want to have entertainment, you go out, right? You're going to see your friends, socialize, you're going to go dance, you're going to hear some music. It's All such on. a strong point. And I yeah. really think as operators, that's our biggest challenge is trying to get them out of the home, really. Yeah. Especially, especially now after COVID. Yes. I mean, we train people that staying home is okay and it's perfectly fine to, to interact via Zoom or whatever it may be. So, yeah. you know, I think that's going to play. It's going to have an impact. It might be 10%, but it's, right. hey, you know, it well, matters. Well, you know, I think, and that the, look, COVID in one year changed our lives, right? But right. in terms of an industry, it's changed it more than any one of those five overnight. That's true. You know, everything else kind of took a while to sink in. You know, sure. every one of those is kind of a generational shift. You know, when Wawa started serving lunches, it wasn't overnight. It's just people get into a pattern and say, oh, right. geez, I, I'm, I'm not going to have my beer, so I might as well just get a hoagie. I got to get, I got to get more work done or whatever it might have been. The, the really big question is what's the future hold? And, you know, I don't think the, um, the paradigm may have shifted and it probably should shift to something that brings people out for a reason, mm. right? So what is right. the reason? So yeah, it could be, and it always will be hopefully about community. Sure. You know, bring them in to talk about things that are, uh, uh, you know, affecting our world, you know, in a way that is safe. You know, you talk about, you know, writing the constitution and, and you know, that was, I'm sure a lively debate, you know, what it should look like. But they got it done. Tell me we can't work out our differences over a beer. You yeah, know? Right, <laughs> Just right. say, man, you're my neighbor. You live right down the street. Where is that going to happen? It's going to be in a bar. Sure. You know, hopefully in a, in a restaurant bar where we get together and understand that we're all part of the same world, all part of the same community, and sometimes living on the same block with difference of, of opinion, that's okay. Yeah. Talk about it, man. You know, say, yeah, I respect that. So I think it's... It's a uh, it's a big question mark, you know. Mm. Can we do it? Uh, can we make first part is can we make people feel safe because we sure. told them for a year stay at home, wear a mask, don't don't go out, don't socialize. You know, we'll get over that. The vaccine is you know it's here, so we're going to get to that point. And I think people really kind of identify what it is they want for their life, you know. And I think that that's uh, up for us to decide. Sure as a as an industry you know i'm a retired guy but i've been my my life has been beer and i think that beer serves a lot of really good purposes uh in a very communal sense and you know just being um it's a beverage of moderation it's a way to go out and celebrate and yet feel close to your your you know fellow you know your neighbor you know your yeah. fellow citizen you know and uh i think it's going to play a bigger role um you know, in the future. I think so as, as well. And I feel that, you know, we've not only been torn apart to some degree, you know, from, from COVID, but, but also all the political unrest, oh, right? Yeah. 
And that's really, it's really made it difficult to have open conversations with people. I mean, I experience it all the time. Yeah. What I see it and sometimes I have to put the kibosh on certain conversations and mm-hmm. that's not who I am. You yeah. know what I mean? But I do it because I know it's not going to go anywhere. You know what? Two pissed off people are going to leave the bar room and I'm going to be sitting there with nobody. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and the, the, the place where the incident took put, you know, the, in their mind, that's yeah. what they're going to think exactly about. Right. right? So it's what a great point. And I'm hoping that, you know, in time that we'll, we'll come together as a nation and, yeah. and be neighborly and, and, you know, you know, it, Joe, it's such a, a, a you know, you just identify something that that um, really is at the crux of it, you know. And I believe that one of the factors, what we saw in the divisiveness in the past year, is that people are sitting at home, and they're either watching Fox News or CNN, mm-hmm. and their minds are going to be set in a way because that's what they're listening to, and there's no dialogue. Confirmation bias. That, and yeah. and you say, okay, well, geez, that makes sense. And you're, you're going to look at it and say, okay, um, if I didn't believe it, uh, that guy's official. He's a newscaster. You know, must be talking the truth or whatever. But it'll make sense. You can listen to CNN. It makes sense. You listen to Fox News. It makes sense. Right. About the same story. It's going to be two different versions. Sure. In the bar, the difference is, you know, and this is, you know, when they talk about, uh, you know, the, the free speech and all that, this kind of stuff. You know, I am in favor of as much information as I can possibly get and let me decide. Mm. Yep. So when you're talking about a tavern, you're going to have a lot of opinions, but you're going to hear somebody who's your neighbor and he's going to say something. You're saying, oh, yeah, well, wait a second. And you're going to have a debate. And at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself somewhere in the middle. You know, he's there. I'm here. And right there is kind of like, you know what? He's got a point. That is the way. Yep that you have a community built, not destroyed, you know? So you talk about this divisive nature, it's because you're sitting at home hearing the same stuff of one person's perspective. There's no dialogue to that TV. Right. So when we talk about that, you know, I think taverns and that community center is a really important part of rebuilding our, you start one block at a time, one bar at a time, and I think we're gonna be okay. Oh, that's that's awesome. I I believe it, I believe it. And I, I hope when we talk about the future, that's what, that's what we're looking at. I'm excited to give people what they used to have when it comes to things like entertainment. Yeah. You know, I can't yeah. wait. It's so hard right now to do something like that with a limited capacity, but yeah. but the day that I can go to a concert and just be around other people yeah. that you know are like minded because they yeah. like the same type of music. You know, how many times you're at a concert and you're sitting there with strangers having a beer, right? <laughs> or or whatever else you might right. be, whatever else you might be doing. <laughs> and uh and you're just like, you know, kumbaya, you know? Yeah. yeah. Life's worth living, you know. It's, that's we gotta get back to that. It's so true, yeah. you know, and, and we'll get there. Yeah. Um concerts are probably a little further off than the local bar. Sure. You 100%. know, I think there's a lot of people just say, Let me in the bar, you know, give me a beer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and talk to the bartender, talk to the guy next to you, you know, and it's, it's start, it's already starting a little bit with the vaccinations and the people saying, okay, the tests are a lot more readily available, a little more confidence confidence. and I, it's, it doesn't, doesn't change overnight. Didn't change overnight to get here. It seems like it was incredibly quick, but it actually took a while and it'll take a while to get, you know, we have to get to the certain percentage of, uh, vaccinations and. We'll be there. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's from everything I hear, the vaccinations are going to be readily available. Uh, yeah. You know, depends what day it is. It'll tell you. It's yeah, sure. Be what month it is. <laughs> right? Yeah. As of right now, it's roughly 2 million a day, and that's huge. Yeah. That's you huge. Know what I mean? right. That's huge. Yeah. 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 Right. Especially where it came from. Right. All right. Um, so this is something completely off topic, but we talked a little bit about this. Um, Joe and I were interested in, I know that Anheuser-Busch used to be the first to always push price increases. Mm. Um, I'm assuming that was nationwide. And what was it like having to deal with the pushback from ownership uh, of operators that are you being the spearhead of that or you dealing with the product that was doing that? Well, thanks for bringing that up. I'm going to have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> that aged me. Um, and Anheuser-Busch would be... Uh, always considered the price leader in markets where they considered themselves the leader. So when you say they're, that's nationwide, it wasn't always nationwide, okay. where they had a, a second position to another brewer, significant second position, um, they wouldn't be the leader. They couldn't afford to be the leader because mm-hmm. they were already not the share that they should have been. So um, they would make it a decision, you know, uh, state by state or market by market. 
So it wasn't always the case, but in, in Delaware County, for some reason in Philadelphia, uh, they felt they were strong enough in the position to, to lead the market. And back in the day when, uh, you know, when I first started, uh, there's, uh, there were some very strong, uh, powerful tavern owners that had a lot of clout and your dad being one, you know, your dad had a strong position about it and they hated price increases. Nobody looks forward to it, but you know, the dynamic of the beer industry, and if you take it back 40 years, 60% of the, of the beer, uh, was sold by taverns. Right. right today, it's uh, call it thirty five percent in that range. It's probably in this past year a lot less than that. But sure. you know, back in a normal pre COVID day, it was forty percent at best. Okay. But back then, it was sixty percent, and forty percent of it was draft. Right. So gotcha. draft rolls. That's twenty. You know, call it twenty five percent of the business. It's draft beer. So bottles and cans weren't necessarily the issue draft wise. So if you go up, you know, you know back then you go up three dollars a keg. You know, so you raise it from 40 to 43 bucks, right? And the shit would hit the fan. Am I allowed to say shit? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, because the dilemma is, if a guy's charging 25 cents for an eight ounce glass of beer. You eat it or you got to pay it And you say, okay, well, the, the glass of beer price, if you filled it to the full eight ounces, it's about a penny and a half for the glass right. of the increase. It's a penny and a half. That's all. Went up a cent and a half. Tavern hunters like, what the hell am I going to do? Right. I can't raise it two cents. Sure. Right? I got to raise it a nickel. I'm going to 30 cents. So we would have these conversations like, okay. And I, you know, I business guy who's going to about to get his ass smacked by a tavern <laughs> owner says, look, buddy, you don't understand. Because uh, I would say, doesn't everybody in your business need an increase? Doesn't your bartender and waitress deserve an increase? Because that's how you get it. Either I'm going to raise it and you can blame it on me or you can raise it yourself because are your utility bills going up? Yeah, yeah, they're going up. Are your taxes going up? Yeah, yeah. What are you going to do? Are you going to sell more or, or are you going to eat the increase? You can't do that. Go up to 30 cents and blame it on Budweiser and sell as much of it as you can. I could just imagine because what that must have felt like. Exercise of utility. <laughs> oh, as these man. Guys. I'd have guys that say, listen to me. Let me take that business degree and put it somewhere very right. special. I can right? see my father rolling over his grave right now. He's saying that, but it had to be an exercise of futility, right? It was, um, you know, because the reality is that they, uh, being the hardworking guys they were, um, they knew the, the, they knew their consumer. And when they had to tell them it went from 25 cents to 30 cents, they're not going to go easy on them. Yeah. Right. So they, they were letting, they were, they were, I think their therein lies the issue. They're taking the heat and they're dumping it right yeah. on me. And in some cases, uh, you know, we would lose taps. And, yeah. uh, you know, we'd go back in and say, okay, let's, uh, what do we need to do? I'll come in here and, and promote even more. We'll get people, we'll, you know, and they'll be all right. It was years and years, every yeah. time we raised. And, you know, as the shift happened from the strong independent tavern owner, it really, you know, the chains never complained. No. You know, the, you know, the, those, that wasn't their issue. Right. You know, they didn't care. As a matter of fact, they thank you because uh -huh. you're giving them a reason to raise the price. And when you pay up a penny and a half and they go up a nickel or a dime, uh, they made out really well. And they can say, it's not us. It's, you know, Budweiser sure. raised the price. You choose Amazing. by choosing another, you know, make your vote with, with drink another beer if you want. They didn't care. But they really hope they would drink Budweiser because they're going to make more money off of it, you know? Yeah, so, right. Anyway, it was those were those were tough times because uh, we didn't have a big share. We were, you know, when I started, we our share was in the teens, yeah. and uh, I think at the height we're probably, you know, with all of our brands we're over forty percent. But you know, Anheuser Busch was always, uh, you know, call it a, a thirty-five share brand. Uh, Budweiser was was strong. Uh, Miller Lite was always a strong brand here. Coors Light. Mm -hmm. So the light beers were, you know, it was either. Miller or Coors or, and then Bud Light, you know, would be the third. And, you know, we've made some uh, progress inroads on that, but those are two strong competitive sure, brands. Sure. So yeah. that's one, one of the things that kept this area out of the 50 plus share for Anheuser-Busch is, yeah. is our light beer share. But I think today it's probably, especially with seltzers and some other things that Bud has done very, very well with right. the product expansion. But like yeah. it's no longer just a light beer; it's seltzer. It's uh, right, right. Uh, so, much. Know, it's so, so much. So much. It's amazing. It's yeah, it's amazing. 
the amount of uh, yeah. choice out there is just it's wild so and it's you, tough to keep up with this as an operator i'm sorry to interrupt you but go ahead yeah no uh, so switching gears a little bit i mean i i am I'm a you know a fan of Bud Light. I, I drink Bud Light, so it's it's one of my go tos. I, mm-hmm. I also like Amstel Light, as, as many people know. My my niece, who's my GM at all three of my locations, remind me that <laughs> I'm the only one that drinks Amstel Light. So when there's three <laughs> cases of it gone, that it was all me that drank it. But um, oh. a brand that I've really followed, and I'm curious to to know, is um, right here in Pennsylvania, Yingling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 um, you know that that I've seen that kind of brand rise from the ashes. I, I started drinking it when I was in college because I knew of it mm-hmm. by going to uh, the American Legion where my <laughs> dad would go. And they, you know, they only had two beers on, on tap was Miller Light and Yingling. And, wow. and that seemed to be like, you know, we go to like a beef and beer yeah. for, you know, whatever the cause was. And it was Miller Light or Yingling or, or whatever <laughs> uh-huh. it was, Budweiser and Yingling. Uh-huh. Um, you know, and, and just kind of, you know, watching it grow and, and seeing that, you know, now people come to the, the bar without question and say, um, I'll have a lager. Yeah. You know, so just your thoughts oh, on, on that brand. Boy, that's another one. I could never, you know, when they coined that, and it, you know, it's an amazing story. Yingling is obviously an amazing story. And we never sold them in, in terms of our, we never had the franchise right, right to the uh, to the brand. But you can't help but respect uh, that company, oldest uh, family owned brewery in the in the country. Um, although to put things in perspective, I was drinking a beer, uh, not long ago and I'm looking at the label, I'm like, what yeah. <laughs> German beer, Weinstefaner started in the year 1041, right? <laughs> like, I'm like, wait, My is that God. right? They're coming up on their thousandth anniversary, right? I'm wow. like, okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, but getting back to the United States here, Dick Yingling is a remarkable, a person and a remarkable story to that brewery, how they were, uh, they were almost out of business, you know, back in the day of the Gretz days where, you know, the, your only hope is somebody buys you up because you didn't, you, you know, local was not in and that's being right. kind, you know, right. local was like, oh, that's a must be a bad beer. It's local. Um, and, you know, Dick Yingling is the guy that got in there, took over from his father. And, um, you know, I think, the brand that really first got them on the map was Black and Tan. Mm. Sure. So Black and Tan was, nobody had a Black and Tan that was, I mean, that that goes back to the, you know, there was back in the, you know, early days, brewers would make Black and Tan. You know, there's half and half and there's Black and Tan. One made with, one's made with lager, the other's made with an ale. Right. But it's, you know, it was marketing that really kind of uh, took that and timing, again, was everything. Dick Ying, his timing was perfect because he hired uh, a guy I love is uh, Dave Casanelli, a local product, uh, Delaware County Delco guy. Dave was uh, is a brilliant guy and a good marketing, really understood the market. So uh, black and tan wasn't necessarily his thing, but longer was. So he saw this volume coming out of black and tan and he understood that he had to get something more, you know, because not everybody wants a black and tan. Sure. It was amazing how much they sold of a black and tan that has point zero, you know, nothing yeah. of the market. So Dave uh, really was the one I think that was, uh, and I don't know this for sure, but I would put it on his shoulders because he certainly made something of it to coin the term lager. You know, when you walk in and say, give me a lager. And boy, being the Budweiser guy in the market, I'm like, well, why don't you serve him a Budweiser? Because yeah. that's a lager. You know, lager is right. just a matter yeah. of the yeast. You know this, right? Sure. It's just... It's a bottom fermenting yeast. Uh, you want an ale, it's a top fermenting yeast. So it is absolutely coining something that is, you imagine going in on a grander scale, give me a beer. And you're, oh yeah, sure, here's your Budweiser. I'm like, wait, yeah. how'd you get the name Lager? That's, you know, that's amazing. Marketing genius. And the other part was price. So we talk about sensitivity to price and Dick Yingling was not the guy who says, I'm gonna get greedy with this. He always wanted to be very close to the market leader, usually Budweiser, right? So his price was always going to be close to Budweiser. So he didn't want to be the guy as perceived as the, you know, the greedy uh, brewer. He's he's been incredibly successful. But, you know, on on the craft side, you'd have guys like, you know, Jim Cook at Sam Adams. Sure. His whole idea was you got to charge a lot to make people believe it's good. Right. Right. And, you know, Sam Adams is a great beer. But pricing was a part that people equate price with quality. 
you know, Dick Yingley wanted to be affordable and he wanted to get, you know, the everyday drinker to be drinking lager, you know, Yingling lager, not, you know, and anybody else's lager, you know, not Sam Adams lager, not Budweiser, but Yingling lager. And, uh, you know, incredibly successful. He's a guy that uh, probably could have sold 10 times over. I, I know he could have sold uh, opportunities to sell to Anheuser-Busch and some of the other big brewers came a, a calling. He has always stole, you know, st stood, you know, fast. He's got, I think, his daughters are running it now. Okay. And, uh, but Dick's an interesting, really interesting guy, Pennsylvania Dutchman. Um, I had a meeting with him one time up in his, in his plant, staring in his blue jeans, smoking a cigarette. <laughs> And pouring the cigarette or putting it out in the, you know, his yingling, you know, can. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And I'm like, there's a big difference between an Ian Anheuser Bush. Yeah. <laughs> You're not smoking anywhere in an Anheuser Bush brewery, but he's smoking in his in his factory, putting it out in his can. I'm like, he can do whatever he wants. It's what his, year was this? This was probably in uh late uh two thousand eight. Yeah. Uh, uh, recent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean reasonably recent. Yeah. But goes to work every day, works his tail off, knows everybody on the plant. You know, my kind of guy. I, you yeah, know, just a, just a good old Dutchman. That's cool. You know? Nice, nice. <laughs> Did they advertise the, the name Lager or was it just work? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. look, I, I think uh, they're advertising again. Dave could probably answer those questions more than I. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Lager, if you even look at the label, um, they, they certainly give uh, their yingling name prominence but the big name on there is lager sure so that is advertising in itself you know i mean you're you're uh you look at that and it's it's like okay you, you don't really look at the word yingling and, and from a distance you'd probably be hard pressed to say what are the letters because it's written in script yeah you look back and you say i all i see is lager i'll yeah. take a lager beer i remember them calling it the chinese beer the first time i heard about yingling it. Yeah. yeah yeah of course yeah. <laughs> i was like dead serious i was in the poconos too i was 10 years old at a wedding and i heard that wow yeah. So speaking of advertising, can you talk a little bit about AB's uh, king of advertising and oh, man, what do you man. know about that? It's got to be some uh, interesting stuff. Well, they are, um, you know, I, I think it goes back to Gussie and understanding the value of, of uh, marketing. And I, I remember one story with Gussie, one of the first times I ever met him, he, used to, he was a huge horse guy. And uh, when I say horse, carriage, you know, Devin Horse Show. Okay. <laughs> he would be out there riding the carriages, and, and uh, there's some great Gussie stories, but one that I remember being a young kid, I was just in the business, and he's at Devin Horse Show, he invites my dad out to dinner. He says, yeah, bring your son along. He, he would never fly anywhere. He always drove his, his uh, uh, land yacht, you know, and had a chauffeur, obviously, but uh, it was pretty luxurious. So we went out to a restaurant, and we're drinking Budweiser like it's the last batch they're going to make, right? And there's 100 bottles on the... <laughs> on the table it's a pretty big group the waiter comes over he starts taking them off he says what are you doing he speaks with a raspy voice what are you doing he says i'm taking some beer i'll make room for dinner he says god damn it leave those bottles there it's advertising <laughs> <laughs> i want people to know what we're drinking uh, i'm pretty great. sure they know what you're drinking there august <laughs> so uh he he understood um you know uh, at the time celebrities were big so um, he did things like, uh, like Frank Sinatra, right? Pretty big name, right? In the day, the biggest. Right. He was the, he was the man. Gussie became friends with him because they both loved the fast life, you know? So they were, they were, uh, good friends. And he says, Hey, you know, Frank, how'd you like to be a bud wholesaler? So Frank Sinatra is a bud wholesaler in, in California. So what does Frank Sinatra want to do? He wants to sell Budweiser. He starts doing Budweiser ads Brilliant. back when, you know, that was really something. Wow. There's a Frank Sinatra on there saying, hey, drink Budweiser, right? Guess who made a lot of money out of that is Frank Sinatra. You know, you could pay him for an ad or you could give him a franchise and want your you know, business triple. So Frank Sinatra was a good friend of Gussie's, but that was kind of his understanding of how things worked. You know, he had big sports uh, stars that were... Uh, you know, the uh, Anna's Bush wholesalers and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they in turn would, you know, promote his product. Uh, and then he got into, you know, cause uh, again, TV was really kind of in the early, early part of it, but it was growing and becoming much more influential. Commercials becoming extremely uh, influential in our lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Gussie kind of 
he he kind of uh, started with the idea of bigger than life events. So he was the guy that was really talking about, hey, I want to own sports. I want to own music. But he didn't really get it done at that point in time. It was still early on. The next shift was into August the 4th. And uh, August the 4th was one of the most amazing people I've ever known in my life. He was uh, a lot different than his dad. Not the big personality. But man, you walk in that brewery, and you better have your, as a plant manager, you better have everything perfect. You should eat off that floor. Hmm. Uh, you know, I remember walking into the hop room, and they, this is back when everybody was using hop pellets. Sure. August Bush said, we're not using hop pellets, we're using hop flour. You know, the real deal, because that's the only way you can get the real rosin out and all that. I'm like, Jesus, this is an expense. Look at the hop room, it's you know, 100,000 square feet of hops all going into the kettle. Uh, now, of course, I think today they're probably using hot pellets. They have to, you know, but right. it's a transition that August didn't want. So he was the brewer. Mm. He was the guy that says, this is going to be the best product you'll ever you'll ever drink. Uh, and he also understood you had to get a message out. So he's the one that opened the purse books for uh, the purse strings for the, for the big sports. So you see them advertising on the Super Bowl, sure. right? They didn't want to just advertise. They wanted exclusivity, brand and product exclusivity. So it's not you would just see a lot of Budweiser commercials. You wouldn't see anything else. No Miller, no course. No, there was an exclusivity to it. So uh, they, when you talk about you know sports franchises, their idea was they want to be the official beer of everything. You know, going to be official beer of every sports franchise. And you walk in a stadium, you're going to be seeing Budweiser signs all over the place. They were unbelievable in terms of their marketing. Um, I mean, they really kind of became one of the premier consumer product advertising companies in the world. Uh, of course, they spent a billion dollars a year on advertising. Yeah. You know, it's, it comes with a lot of money. Sure. And uh, and it worked. I mean, they drove their market share up uh, enormously. Um, advertising was uh, was king. Today, uh, I think they've done a, a remarkable job in get trans transitioning to a social media world mm-hmm. driven by social media um they will put ads out on the, on social media that you would never be able to see they're funny as hell but they're totally uh you sure. know not for prime time right, right, you're right. gonna get some ads you're like oh that's really yeah. good you know the swear jar remember the swear jar uh-huh. yeah it was one of the first ones that was like okay that's that's an awesome ad you know yeah. you'll never see that on tv right, right, right. <laughs> think i borrow your pen i'm sorry brad what you, what's that but you know that's can i stuff. borrow your fucking pen yeah. <laughs> there you go all right fucking the swear jar yeah right it was to buy bud light you know right, it's right, pretty right. funny sorry it just cursed again that's all right um there's a lot of um damn what was i gonna say a lot of the, the advertisement that I remember growing up to was all Budweiser based. I remember being in grade school and making fun of, you know, or, or joking around with what we saw, you know, the Super Bowl. So they, they oh, jumped yeah. on early. Was the 60s like the, the big rise for Budweiser? Later. Yeah, so, I mean, we're talking about the 70s where Schlitz was uh, the leading brand and um, some strong regionals, but Anheuser Busch being up there, Schlitz was number one, uh, Schaefer. Um, but Schlitz, uh, interesting sidelight on this but uh what a amazing story of a brand collapse uh and i remember being uh uh studying uh, some effects of their advertising you talk about positive advertising there's also negative advertising where it actually shows that you are less likely to drink a beer that beer after you watch an ad get out schlitz had one of those campaigns schlitz was uh they had a campaign called <laughs> <laughs> you take away my gusto, right? So it was all about the gusto of Schlitz. And uh, I might have some of the little details wrong, but they ran some ads that <laughs> if you're watching it, you're like, what? What the hell is that? You take away my gusto. You take away my gusto. And they had one, a boxer, sweaty boxer. And it's he's punching the camera. Like he's going to beat the crap out of you if you take away his Schlitz. You know, my, you oh, take away okay. my gusto. Okay, okay. I'm going to, you know, so don't don't mess with me. I'm going to take, well, proven uh, that if you watch this ad, you would you would not drink the beer anymore. <laughs> so it's like, I, I'm not going to. bullies drink it. So, yeah, right? <laughs> and then the other thing they did, and this really, I think, is a testimony, because this is this is testimony to uh, Anna's Bush and their commitment to great brewing, um, that uh, one of the things they did, they, they actually hired a, a guy that was with Anheuser-Busch for, for years and he became the head of Schlitz. And he, um, 
he bought in some technology and you know a, a lager beer is going to spend 28 days in a in a tank right sure. so the problem with schlitz is they didn't uh, they didn't have enough capacity they were selling uh. out all the time so you either build a new brewery or you figure out how to get more turns out of your tanks so you can put an enzyme in that artificially speeds up the enzyme uh for yeast to to convert Quick in the process yeah. con, uh, convert sugars to uh you know uh, co2 and alcohol mm. and instead of 28 days it, it can be done in seven days or whatever it was i'm not it might be wrong on that but it's not 28 days the problem was they didn't have it nailed down so one schlitz would taste great the other one's going to be like <laughs> what happened here you want to mess with the quality of product uh you're taking a lot of risks there and between the bad advertising and that change in their uh, in their production, uh, they went down a pretty quick uh, slope, sure. and were not even a factor a number of years later. So they went from you know one to done, um, in in a short period of time. Wow. And I think it also fit into August Bush IV saying you know proof to his you know motto and business acumen to say, don't mess with the quality. Quality is number one. So where Gussie Bush was saying you know, making friends is our business. You know, there's August Bush the Forest saying quality is our foundation. You know, it's it is uh the dauntless defender of quality is the Bud Man slogan, you know. It's <laughs> like, oh I remember that guy. Um and you know, we talk about advertising and marketing, PJ, and back before the T V ads and all that, it was guerrilla marketing. You right. know, when I first started, we would go out every night and and I was usually wearing the the Budman costume, and you go in. And did you so wear it? Did you wear it? Oh hell yeah! God bless, Bud you. Man. God bless you. You were badass, we Budman. Okay. Uh, Are there any pictures? Uh, I've got a couple in a uh, safe somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Next episode <laughs> over a poker game. It's pretty. They're pretty. Uh, yeah, telling. <laughs> but needless to say, you're going into a bar, young adult bars, 21 to you know 30 year old is the core area. People are having fun, and you're going in and open up the wallet and say, you know what, yeah. Bud's on me. And you are the celebrity. That was the first superhero, Bud Man. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bud, the dauntless defender of quality. So that's dauntless really that's great. That, was, that was, and you'd have little stupid little games like, you know, you know what Budweiser stands for? I know you know this, right? No. Because you deserve what every individual should enjoy regularly. How about that? You never, yeah. never heard yeah. that. And then you say, well, here's some bonus points. You know what it means backwards. No. Ah, see? All right. You don't know what forwards. You're not doing no, backwards. <laughs> so backwards, it says, remember every soldier in every war defended us bravely. So somebody answers that one, and you say, you're drinking all night on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I'll tell the bartender, that guy drinks on me all night. That's, That's pretty good. Great. So, uh, you know, you, you go out and have fun. You know, we yeah. talk about the community. We talk about having fun. And, you know, it's changed. Um, you know, the 0.08s and all that, it's like it needed to change. You know, I think sure. that we have a much safer society today. And, um, you know, I think alcohol is not the bent, meant to be abused. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's taken its toll on a lot of people because it's not being done, you know, or consumed right, right. in a, in a uh, you know, safe way. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have laws in place. So, okay. And then you have to, take the safety your own personal health in, into consideration drink in moderation you know and it's a fun fun product so i think you know some things haven't changed it's still a fun business yeah. uh the way it's sold is dramatically different yeah to get something on the shelf in today's crowded world of thousands of brands is next to impossible i would hate to have to build a brand uh it'd be dependent on build, building a brand image in today's market, yeah. very, very difficult to do. It's funny, the, um, you know, a lot of, there's a ton of IPAs out there, and the reason being is because they're the quickest and the cheapest one that you can produce. And lagers, like you were saying, take yeah. 28 days. Yeah, and well, IPA in general, I mean, it's an ale. Yeah. So yeah. ale, you know, we're a lager, so it is about heat, you know, so ales can be brewed at a, at a uh, I'm sorry, warmer temperature and everything heat is an accelerator mm. in anything biologically so when you brew something at a warmer temperature and top fermenting yeast brews at a warmer temperature than bottom fermenting lager yeast so any ale is going to be turned in the, in the tank you know a week or less where mm. it's 28 days for a cold lagering of a of a lager beer 
lager yeast. So, you know, yeah, I think any small brewer is probably going to say, I'm going to try to start with ales because I'm not going to have enough equipment to brew, you know, lagers. Right. Uh, it's going to tie up a tank for, for a month. That's going to be too much. Sure. Yeah. So on that note, you know, because we're, we're talking, we're, we're essentially getting there. We talk a little bit about, you know, Anheuser-Busch and we're talking about Bud and Bud Light. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, Yingling has been, uh, you know, a fan favorite for us mm -hmm. Pennsylvanians. Craft beer. Yeah. How has that changed even even your business model, you know, as Gretz? But then, you know, how do you see that change in the landscape today? Because I know, I know for me, it changed the way I think about buying a keg mm -hmm. and putting oh, it on tap. Yeah. You know, never did I ever think that I'd be charging $9 for a 16-ounce pint of, of beer in right. my life because I yeah. thought that there's no way in hell that anyone in Delaware, any, <laughs> any, any blue-collar worker in Delaware County is going to look at me. <laughs> he's he's going to look at me and walk straight out that door. But, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's like a revolution. Yeah. yeah, it is. And, you know, I wish it was around when I was fighting those price wars when they would go up right. three bucks. I'm like, oh, really? Now tell me how much price matters. Sure. Um, look, craft has been great for beer. Uh, I don't think anybody could, could argue that. I mean, it brings in um, a broad, you know, a base of consumers. Uh, it brings in interest. You get uh, anything from New England IPAs. I mean, the type of yeast yeah. really kind of mm. changes the, um, you know, the, the basic uh soul of the beer really but the hops are the spice you know so if you're talking about different hops the varietals are amazing what they're doing today with with hops and uh, filtering or non-filtering right but you know it does get back to saying okay there's a price to pay so mm -hmm. um i think they've shown that um you know for us as a wholesaler we loved it because you're making a lot of margin you know it's the same you know percent margin but the dollars are huge. Yeah. Now, of course, the inventory costs and the you know the picking of it. You're not picking pallets. You're picking cases. Mm. Um, you know, so you know there's a higher cost, but it's it, it's a very very good thing for for beer. Um, and you know, it's not the first. We talk about cycles. You know, sure. so it's amazing how things have uh, transitioned. We talked about you know local and and. Uh, you know, back in the early days of brewing. So everybody had their own little brewery yep. to the big national to um, back in uh, probably 20, 30 years ago, there was a first wave of, of craft. So um, a lot of people came out. I mean, you had brands like Independence and, you know, some others at uh, Dock Street. And, you yeah. know, there, there was yeah. a bit of a bump a number of years ago, but not all of them uh, were making great product, right? And right, they right. didn't command the presence that, that the guys are doing today. So um, really, you talk about the local uh, craft uh, leaders, you know, uh, Bill and Ron, um, Bill Kovaleski, Ron Barche at Victory, uh, make a great, great product, yeah, you know, and they were agreed. really one of the first guys that, um, you know, jumped out and made a big, big statement locally with craft. Uh, Trogues out of, out of Hershey, you know, um, Tom Kehoe, you know, out of yeah. yards. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got some great brewers yeah. in the local area. And, you know, the difference is uh, these guys are here to stay. You know, I sure. mean, they're they're making great product. They're local uh, and they're and they're charging a premium, you know, but yeah. they can get it. And they make a variety of brands and styles and flavors mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, they're doing sours. They're doing, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So it's really you know, when, when you don't do that as an industry, you open the door for other competitors, in this case, spirits, you know. So, yeah. you know, I look at it and say, okay, there was a hot wave uh, the last couple of years with the seltzers. Well, seltzers, you know, the, the great thing about seltzers is that for the beer industry would have been a spirit. That would have been a, right, a vodka right. drinker or sure, something sure. that's going to get me, uh, you know, hard the hard spirits are going to get yeah. the, that consumer, not beer. Yeah, that that's not a typical beer drinker. Right, that's right. so it's getting more female in there. Yeah. It's refreshing. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, the cherry vodka club. It, exactly. It yeah. doesn't mm -hmm. taste like beer, you know, so you're yeah. getting people in that that's all fruity and, you know, it tastes good, but it's uh, low calorie, low carb. So they've hit a niche there that is really, really good. So that gave beer a bigger, you know, the, the, the uh, size of the pond has gotten bigger on that one, yeah. you know, which is which is really the what everybody wants. You want to grow, you know, grow the industry share, not just take from somebody else, you know, where yeah. you're just, 
you know, everybody, you know, the IPAs, there's the thousands of IPAs mm -hmm. in the market, you know, one versus the other, you know, it's somebody's hot today and not tomorrow. Yeah. It's so yeah. quick, a very fleeting consumer base. You know, it's funny you met, we, we, you mentioned something earlier when we were talking about the craft beer. When I was, before I was 21, actually, mm -hmm. I was hanging out with a bunch of guys, network computer guys, right? And they, they would all go to Monk's Cafe. Yes. And that was like the place to go get imported Love beer and, oh, yeah. and craft. And I fell in love with like Rogue's Dead Guy out there. Like I would, oh. I would drink it till I couldn't, you know. <laughs> Dead guy. Yeah, couldn't yeah. walk out of the place. But that place would actually have a lot of good deals because the stuff wouldn't, didn't have the shelf life. And it has so many beers. So we were drinking like these, what, what we're, we just called them imports or mm -hmm. Belgian know, triples. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we were just like, these things were great. And you're, you're yeah. drinking them in a small glass and you know, four or five later, you're like, this is great. And you couldn't get them anywhere. You couldn't get them anywhere else. Yeah. You know, like this is back in my college days. So I'd hang out at Cavanaugh's and you know, yeah. West Philly and stuff like that. But we go in the town and we, we'd hit a couple of these places, but now it's like, you know, the, like you said, the demand's there, right? They, yeah. they, they've, they've, they've carved out this market and uh, people want People want that. You yeah, know, they they want yeah. that. They want don't don't want just the German beers, right? They yeah. they want to have these, uh, you know, these new, you know, spicy, sour, you know, different flavors, and it's 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 a different palate, and yeah. you know, it's, it's something that's special. It's very it, similar to how the uh, the wine enthusiasm, you know, that that world. It's yeah. very um, oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's you know, it's funny, and you mentioned one of my favorite beers uh, and favorite people was uh, Jack Joyce out of uh, Rogue. So you yeah. talked about Rogue, yeah. Jack Joyce uh, was a, uh, he was one of the, I think one of the original founding guys of Nike, right? Oh, wow. Very wealthy oh, guy. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. A bud drinker, you know? <laughs> but he knew, uh, he knew craft beer. And he had un unlimited funds. And his son, uh, you know, uh, Brett is, is to this day a, a friend. And before people knew about really great, great tra a a craft beer, Jack Joyce was telling his brewmaster, I want you to brew the best beer you can buy. Price is no object. And right. he had, there was a guy who says, I'm not putting it in a six barrel. It's going to be a half. So, you know, this is back when, you know, 150 bucks for a keg or $200 yeah. for a keg was like, what? How right. much are you talking about? People, if you want, you want to put on a dead guy, that's what it's going to yeah. cost. And I remember Jack Joyce saying he was on a panel at a at National Beer Wholesalers meeting. And uh, the question to the panel was, how do you determine what price you can charge for your beer, right? So there was the first person who went and says, well, we do a lot of marketing and sites and we do panels and we get people in uh, to uh, run some things by them and would you pay this, would you pay that? And then we figure out, okay, regionally, what are the competing brands? And it gets to Jack's turn and he says, well, here's what we do. I uh, tally up all the costs it takes to make the beer, figure out what kind of profit we need to make, and uh, that's the price of the beer. Yeah. <laughs> the moderator's Business like, 101. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's in theory, it. In theory, right? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, everyone's laughing. It's like, that's yeah, crazy. it's actually that yeah, simple. Yeah. What right. do you, what right. did you, and he, and he, tells, he tells the brewer, but here's the thing. Don't make a cheap beer and ever right. blame it on I had a budget. Right. And that's right. why to this day, Rogue is, you know, they're still independent. Uh, their beers are are unbelievable. Dead Guy is uh, remarkable. Double Dead Guy. Yeah. Stay, that's what Got a chauffeur. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> For the land yacht. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But they make some amazing, amazing beers. But anyway, I had to tell no, you that because it's, it's a great. Jack Joyce story and Brett that's Joyce are, they're just, that Jack has uh, unfortunately passed on, but Brett is um, still one of my uh, favorite people. Great, great people. Yeah, out of Oregon. Yeah. So we, you know, one of the things that's uh, another interesting um, part of this industry and in alcohol being, this is broader than beer, this is alcohol industry. Um, is 0.08, you know, and and it is it has been uh, it's there for a reason, you know. We're talking about uh, 0.08 is, uh, you know, um, as I mentioned before, I think it's even more dramatic how it's changed uh, the fatalities and uh, incidents of drunk driving. Every statistic says it's been 
a, a huge success in making the road safer, which is what right. we want. We don't want people ever having, you know, you want it to be zero, you know, but the reality is uh, whether they're drinking at home or drinking, you know, at a bar, yeah. we've got to be careful, right? So point of weight's important. And, you know, I think it's the, the, the statistics are understated because when I was in my 20s and 30s, if you were drinking and you were uh, erratic and driving, the, the officer would probably uh, maybe even uh, follow you home, make sure you made it. You wouldn't, sure. you would, there was no field sobriety. So the incidents of that were never even tracked, you know, and it would be an accident where it would come up. So right. if you get in an accident, it might be a different story. But today, everything is, you, you get stopped, you can expect it to be, if you're erratic, you're, you're gonna get tested. The difference today, and you know, I hear people talking about, oh, because yeah, I was on the Center for Alcohol Policy, a great uh, think tank about the industry of not just alcohol, um, but overall uh, society issues and how alcohol plays a role. And we hear every argument. So there's arguments, oh, it should be 0.05 or 0.02 or something. Sure. And you know, there is nothing to support that it should be anything uh, more aggressive than 0.08. I think it's a huge, huge mistake because then what you do is dilute the effectiveness. 0.08 is something everybody's aware of and you be careful. Right. What you don't need to do is take somebody who's had a beer and say you're gonna go to jail. Right. You know, what that does is actually take the, the person who's really the problem and makes him one of a bigger audience. You don't mm. need to dilute that. You, you do want to have a DUI oh, be yeah. something. You say, you know, I, I got a, I'm a, it's a DUI, it means something. Yeah. It should always mean something. You know, if you make it where everybody has one, then you're part of a bigger community and no big deal. That's not where we want to go. Right, right. What we have to make sure we do is stop the, you know, the repeat offender and the, and the really high BAC is, is a, a threat. But the bigger thing that we have to really be aware of, and it's people talk about, I'm like, I don't under, understand why this isn't a, more of a, social topic is is marijuana we know about already prescription drugs and other sure. drugs that are in but you know marijuana you talk about legalizing and making it you know part of our society um it is not controlled you know even if they talk about it being sold at a at a, a little hop house or a hop house a, a pot house <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know there is no way if you get stopped and you had two beers but you've been smoking pot for four hours you're gonna be part of an alcohol statistic, not part right. of a pot That's statistic, true. because they're not testing, nor do they have the benchmark, right? We all know 0.08, everybody knows 0.08 is a benchmark. You're over that, you're getting arrested. Uh, what is that number for pot? You know, or, you know, prescription drugs or whatever? Sure. There is none. Right. You know, their breathalyzer for, for beer is pretty easy to do, it's gonna be done. So it's going to be an alcohol statistic, even though you're on something else. So I, you know, I really kind of, I, this is really one of the things that I was pretty um, hot and heavy about when I was on the uh, Center for Alcohol uh, Policy is that, you know, we have to push as a society to um, talk about the effects, uh, driving effects of, of uh, marijuana. You know, I think that we could, all say that the government wants to sell it because it's tax revenue. Yeah, sure. It's going to be legalized. Right. But it shouldn't be legalized until we're able to say, how are we going to control it and how do we measure its yep. effect? And pot is like alcohol. You can go from very mild to really strong, right? So sure. uh, not all pot is created equal is what I heard. You know, I've <laughs> I'm not a pot smoker, but the reality is I think that it, it could have a huge effect negative effect on on the roads and i i think we got to be really really careful so uh until we until we figure that out i think we got to just kind of say hey a medical marijuana you know uh of course you got to be right. kidding me uh i remember talking to one of our legislators and i was in the beer business at the time and uh they're talking about passing the medical marijuana bill i was like well that seems you know like it's going to happen he says um a uh, heroin is illegal. <laughs> like what? When did you pass that bill? <laughs> right. sure. Oxycontin. It's, it's an opiate. You know, that's what all these really addictive prescription sure. drugs are. They're heroin or opiate derivatives. So uh, tell me why that we're not going to have a medical marijuana that stops seizures and all that. You got a good point, you know, right, and right. it's, it's, uh, you know, kind of like a no brainer, you know, but 
I, I, not that anything in, in politics is a no-brainer, but it's a pretty good point. Right. Uh, no, it so. definitely needs some type of metric. That metric, for sure. measurable and understandable. And, and and my understanding is there there is now improved testing um, to allow like a field sobriety test to determine if it's in you right okay. now. Um, I don't know. I've just... This it's is only just all blood, an, right? anecdotal that I've that I've you know okay. spoke to people about this, but that for the longest time is one of the biggest things. It stays with you thirty days. Of course. So like if you had it yesterday, but tomorrow today you get a DUI, right? And you get tested, and it's in your system. Unless you have a medical marijuana card, which by the way is, yep. the, is the new get out of jail free card. That's right. Because you pretty much get them; they're pretty easy to get. Yeah, yeah. You, you can know. you can get that, but uh, what I'm saying is, even if you had. Um, a medical marijuana card, yeah. right? And you are stoned. What's impaired? Yeah, what's yeah not? sure. What's impairment? So just because you have the card doesn't mean you're allowed to. You know, look, I'm, I'm over twenty one. I'm allowed yeah. to drink beer. Doesn't mean I'm allowed to drunk sure, uh, drive sure. drunk. Yeah, right. There's a rule, and yeah. it's point oh eight. So even though it's legal to use it, you're not allowed to abuse it. You know, yeah. so define abuse. Yeah, exactly, and that, that's you the know, point of what I'm saying. Like the, the testing has to be to a point. Where they need to know what quantities in your in your right in the field or by going and doing blood work and my understanding is it's coming around. There's some new testing that's happening around that world yeah. in, in that world, but it's it's not something that's readily available. Yeah. You can't go to Chester Crozier Medical Center and right. determine how much pot you have in your body today and whether or not that impaired you because yeah. it could have been from yesterday or the day before, and yeah. that makes it that makes it difficult, right? You could you could do a hair sample and you're going to find out the the drugs that are in your system, but it doesn't mean you're impaired. That's right. right. So you smoked pot four yeah. days ago. I can tell you that, but I can't yeah, tell sure. you what I don't know is you're stoned right now. Yeah. You know. So what you have to be able to do, and I think that as far as my knowledge on this is it it's still a blood test, you know, sure, you can right, do a blood right. test, but a blood test is, you know, now you're getting into a uh, field sobriety versus that mm -hmm. oh, we're going to go down to the hospital and do yeah. draw some blood. It's another step. It's another step. And it's also one that's much more invasive. And yes, you're talking is. about people saying, Hey, I will do a field sobriety, but I will not do a, you're not going to let you draw blood. Right. And you know, there's, there's some things that are, people are going to have some rights and say, I'm not going to, you're not sticking a needle in my arm. Yeah. You're not going to do it. So, uh, you know, look, there's laws that say you have to, or you're going to, or this is going to be Lose the consequence. License, yeah. You don't want to do a field sobriety. You're going to do and get your blood drawn. They say, no, okay, that's fine. You don't have to, but you're losing your license. Yep. So, you know, I think all those things have to be worked out. It's a really, really difficult social uh, topic right yeah, now. It is. And, uh, you know, I think for our industry, we, uh, I thought about it a lot. I think that there's something that affects our industry negatively that people don't talk enough about yeah. the effects of other alcohol or other uh, 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 chemicals, uh, chemicals yeah, and, yeah, and mind altering drugs that are yeah. affecting you and combined with alcohol are, uh, are really bad. And the only thing they're really effective at testing is alcohol. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be interesting so, to see what that future is like. Oh like, yeah. Are, are they going to combine, you know, like is, do, do you see the, the big guys investing in that now or thinking about going down that road as far as uh, cannabinoids in, in craft beers or whatever? Or uh, are they just investing in it um, for a financial standpoint? Well, um, so you have you do have brands like Constellation or companies like Constellation yeah. that bought into a Canadian um, cannabis company. And I, I forget the exact numbers, but it was like, you know, the company might have been selling you know, six million dollars in in sales, right? And they spent, you know, uh, whatever billion to buy <laughs> to buy yeah, half. Right, right, exactly, right. Wait, wait, wait. What? Yeah. I like because crazy. the potential, right? Right. Yeah, because so, like, guess what? Yeah. They're already in business. They're already licensed. They've yeah. already got their. So it's like, okay, this isn't about what they are uh, today. It's what they can be down the road. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, and they've of course they've got a lot of cash. Um, it, you know, as far as blending into alcohol, I mean, this is expanding your, your world of, of business. Mm -hmm. So while you have, uh, your core business being beer, they're all hedging their bets saying, I want to get some, you know, other, you know, a foot in another sure. industry that is like that. Um, I think one of the things that has been pretty much determined is that you're not going to be seeing beers infused with. Okay. You know, actual marijuana where the CBD is going in and, and mind altering into an alcohol product. Yeah. You know, even but maybe, at, maybe at a bar level, because I know there's a lot of sodas right now that are mixing ca uh, cannabinoids in them uh, and they might be used you, as mixers. But yeah, that, that could law. be, I mean, look, um, 
I gave you an example of one in recent history where it was uh, identified by the FDA as being unsafe was Four Loco when they first came out. Mm. Right. Remember Four Loco, high alcohol, 12% ABV, and high caffeine, right? So it's like a Red Bull in a really powerful drink. Like a malt and beverage. Yeah. Like a, it was a malt beverage and people were chugging it and, you know, abusing it and seeing how, how quickly it could pass out. And you had videos that were like, what is going on with this product? Government says unsafe to uh, have an additive of caffeine into beer. Wow. So you can't have a, a caffeinated beer right now uh, by according to the federal government. Now, could you add it at the bar? You, you can do a rum and Coke. Yeah. You know, you do, yeah. you do caffeine beers. You do Red Bull and vodka. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a mixed beer or a mixed uh, drink, you know, where alcohol, you could, I don't know what it would taste like, but nothing yeah. to stop you from doing it. But I, I think the point is it's, uh, um, you know, it's proven to be unsafe at, on a massive level. Sure. So I know we were talking before about great, you know, great experiences in the in the beer industry. And, you know, look, you can't spend 40 plus years full time <laughs> in the beer business without having some great stories. I got a lot of amazing, amazing stories. I just can't tell them in public. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly can't, you know, drop names. But, you know, when you talk about uh, traveling the world, you know, yeah. seeing uh, seeing so many different countries, I think I've been in 15 countries, you know, and and experience in beer culture and restaurant culture and, and life in these different countries and comparing them about, you know, to what do we have here? Things like the Oktoberfest in Munich, you know, what an amazing, a million people a day go wow. to that party. A million people a day. It's crazy. It's a professional drinking event, you know? It is unbelievable Jeez. to see that, that event. That's big numbers. Uh, but, you know, car races, uh, uh, you know, heavyweight championships, mm -hmm. uh, the World Series, the, you know, the Super Bowl. Uh, horse races and BJ, <laughs> I will tell you, Joe, this is, um, you know, I tell people, I've told this people, uh, so many people this story yeah. and they're like, what, what did you do? Yeah. So PJ and I were at the Kentucky <laughs> Derby. Oh God. You remember the year? You know what PJ, I, so I want you to tell this story because I love this night. One of the greatest nights of my life. And I wouldn't have believed it unless I was there. I don't think people believe it when I tell it. <laughs> so there's a little blues bar in Louisville called Stevie Ray's. And you know, my dad had been going out to the Derby for 20 years at that point. And so he knows everybody in the town, blah, 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 blah. And you know, a lot of people come through and they'll come out, you know, a, a year here or they'll never come back out again. But I know Mike had been out there you know, several times uh, and met with my dad and whatnot. So one year I'm out there with my buddies and it was a good group of us, probably about six of us. And we go to Stevie Ray's because we hear it's a good blues bar. Well, little do we know that it's like the celebrity center of the town on Derby <laughs> Day. And it's just a little blues bar. It's probably maybe the length of my place, which is, you know, 100 feet max, yeah. 150 feet. Um, and we go in and there's a house band playing. Um, two of our friends get in a fight with somebody immediately about something, <laughs> right? So it was all over seating. Cause I now believe to, the story, by right, the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, and it, you know, it was like uh, they fought a little person, you know, like it was that crazy, right? <laughs> I hope that's the right moniker. Um, so we're, we're getting situated at the tables, whatever, and we start seeing these celebs roll in. Pam Anderson comes in with Kid Rock. Right, and we're like, oh, okay, who's Pam Anderson? Kid Rock. I asked Pam for a kiss. She blows me off. Kid gets in my face. Like this is all going on, right? So there, this group just starts forming next to us, right? Carson Daly walks in. Um, after that, Taylor Dane, Travis Tritt, um, Slash, Slash, <laughs> Bo Derek, Bo Derek, right? Bo Derek. Yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, like it was bananas. It was amazing. Uh, so then we're all standing, like listen to the house band. They're literally at the table next to us, right? And we're it's only you know, ten tables in the whole place. <laughs> yeah, right. Small. <laughs> Probably seventy people in there, right. right? Ten of them are us, and thirty of them are the celebrities. <laughs> and then Kid Rock gets up on on stage, which is from here to that wall, ten feet away, and he starts playing Travis Tritt's "Long Long Way to Richmond." Travis Tritt gets up on stage. Slash gets up on stage. What? Taylor, Taylor Dane, Dane gets up on he stage. He says, Taylor, get up here. Sing. We need some vocals. And they're playing to us. Right. <laughs> like, and I just remember, like, I, can, I got chills. Party. I remember standing against that brick wall with my arm around Mike, like, we couldn't be in a core place in the world. In right? the world. <laughs> in the world. 
It was, it was like, it makes you want to cry. It was that much fun. Wow. It was, I mean, there was other stuff going on in that place too, but <laughs> I bet. it was unbelievably unreal. It was just, yeah. God, I mean, I'll remember the rest of my life. Yeah, and yeah. I will too. And, yeah. you know, and I, I talk about all these things that were so amazing over 40 years in a, in a profession. And there is one common thread and it's the people. Yeah. You know, yeah. that night, if I'm there, with anybody but you yeah. by my imagine being there by yourself and saying, right. Jesus, what nobody would believe you. Nobody would believe you. No cell phone I'm there with one of my best friends. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God, I love this guy. Yeah, it was and it was amazing. Like, oh man. my God, what uh -huh. the hell's going on? Remember when Kid Rock gets up there and he says to the guitar player, Hey buddy, mind if I play? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, mind if you yeah. play, here's my guitar. It was you know, just totally blew him away. Meanwhile, yeah. you know, one after the other is going and they came down to watch the, watch the concert too. But it's, you know, and this is really something about the industry. Um, it's the greatest people business in the world. You know, you build these memories with your friends and you, this is how you build relationships. Mm -hmm. You yeah. go out and do some things. And we had the good fortune of doing a lot of fun things. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, every single story I have, at the core of it, there's somebody I was there that I really, really cared about, yeah. you know? And, uh, and you know, really, honestly, uh, this was almost always with some of our sales team, our managers, sure. or people that work with every day. We're all busting our hump. And here you get a chance to go out and, and have some fun, do some stuff that's like off the charts. I mean, yeah. things that you're saying, this is a, this is a bucket list ex life experience that yeah. um, you'll remember for the rest of your life. Sure, yeah. And you'll remember who you're with, you remember everything about it, and we're gonna have a lot of fun, yeah. right? So it is, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things for, for me, it was so hard when we made a decision uh, on on uh, selling. You know, uh, it well, was- Well, you know what, before you even get there, yeah. let, let me say, um, I just wanna bring up that for years and years and years, there, has always been you know the beacon in the bigger business in this region and it's been the Gretz family and you and and Gretz Budweiser and um there it, there is really no comparison as far as when it comes to business business owners um bar operators there no one holds anybody on a pedestal like they do you and your family wow. and I think it's a testament over to to you as as a people person and and understanding that it is a community first right and it's making relationships um it, it's it's building friendships you know as uh, the bush family says and yeah. i think you you and your family have been the embodiment of that and i there's still you know there's there's budweiser drivers that are still talking about like damn i wish mike and these guys were still around and it's there's a huge hole missing yeah. in this area um but you I, I can't say enough good things, and 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 it's not me; it's everyone, Mike. No. And we're grateful for you and your family and everything you've done for our well, business. Thanks, PJ. Yeah. Right back at you. You know, it's guys like you that made this uh, so much fun and yeah. and uh, memorable. You know, and it's and it's and it's the people I worked sure. with every day. Those drivers. You know, um, I always uh, hoped, if anything, they would know that I appreciated how much they gave that yeah. business. Oh, you they know, do. They the do. The sales reps, the managers. I mean, those were my friends. You know, they were my life. You know, mm -hmm. I worked a lot of hours, and you, you make a lot of. Uh, um, you know, let's say you put your personal life uh, on on hold. Sure. You know, you're you're always first and foremost. I'm a dad, um, but you know, I I think the the business meant so much to me and it was the people that made it you know to this day i think if i see a driver and i'm not pulling over i want to talk to him say how you, how you doing you know yeah. everything all right um so look they're they're with a good company Penn's a great company um they're they're big though and it's sure. it's hard you know i think i was closest to the uh, to the employees when we were the smallest when you get a certain size it's hard to be close um yeah. You know, even though we're a union shop, you want people to know I care about their health, I care about their safety. And, uh, you know, we had, I think we had a good rapport. We had a lot of respect uh, between us. I always felt respected, uh, not always loved, because you have to be a leader and sometimes you make mm -hmm. tough decisions. But um, I think that everybody knew I had them at, at heart. And I would say over, over 40 plus years, you know, as an example, we never laid off a single person, not one. Wow. Not a single person for a single day, you know. So that's something you say. 
you have to pay your bills. You can't wonder if you have a job tomorrow, right? Yeah. So we had bad months. We had bad, you know, some bad years. Everybody's working. You know, oh, wow. everybody's working. So, you know, not that they uh, always think, oh, geez, I'm grateful just to have a job. But, you know, it says something when you're saying, I, you know, your job's here. You oh. know, I'm not going to be that uh, that guy who says, hey, I can make more money. I don't really need you this week. Really? Right. How right. am I going to pay my, you know, for my yeah. food? So, um, look, I loved the people. I loved our customers. You know, not all of them. PJ, I wish everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I got to this story. One of the greatest lines I ever heard was when I was a, when I was younger and I was buying some appliances for my home and I go into this place and uh, I'm like you, Joe, I, I don't want to ever pay retail <laughs> for anything. Right? <laughs> so I'm buying a washer dryer and I get this guy working down, working down. I got him, you know, 80%, 75%, 70%, free delivery. You know, <laughs> I said, let me, let me think about it. We've been talking for an hour getting through this, <laughs> working this guy. <laughs> He's breaking out in the sweat. And he had the greatest line. He says, you know what? I wish I had even 10 customers like you. I said, really? He says, yeah, unfortunately, I've got 100. <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm like, oh, that's pretty good, buddy. I'll pay you the, oh, I'm yeah. buying it. You gave me the greatest line ever. Yeah. Wish I had even 10, but I got 100. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. You're making my life miserable. That's so but, good. But yeah, the reality is that you know, you know, retailers are all over the board. You know, They all work hard. Uh, you know, whether it's pricing or promotion or support, you know, um, not everybody's always happy about what you do every yeah. day, uh, but you can listen. And I said to people, you know, I remember it's just a simple thing. You, know, you talk about simple things that matter. You know, it's the guy who walks in the sales rep but doesn't know the bartender's name. Mm -hmm. It's a simple thing, yeah, right. but it's really important. For me, answer your phone, call me back. Oh. Say to you know when I when the cell phones come in you know and the you know secretary says hey somebody was looking for you I didn't know whether to give them their cell phone I said the company's paying for the cell phone <laughs> give them my number really you seem angry it's especially the angry guy right, right. you don't want to hear him and he's going to get angry if I don't talk to him I might not have an answer for him but at least I can hear him and at least explain our position on it you know so. Simple little things, you yeah. know, if somebody's going to complain about your, you know, the price of the sandwich or, you know, or the beer or whatever it is, talk to them, hear them, say, yeah. I'm really sorry. What else, you know, what would you like me to do? You know, I'm trying to make the best product, whatever. Have the conversation, show them you care. Simple yeah. management one-on-one. It, 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 it can, especially in the days of social media now, I do it. I mean, you oh, see yeah. me all the time yeah. in these groups and whatever. I literally say, here's my cell phone number, call me. Yeah. yeah. And then the follow-up responses you get, and yeah. and that guy knows how to run a business. Sure. Like just, just random people that see that in that public forum. I do it all the time. Like yeah. our good friend, buddy Greg would just, there he is again, you know, like I, I joke around, say you need my number, just search for my name because you'll, my, my cell phone number is plastered all over the internet. But it's important. Mm -hmm. It's good because management. they need to know it's one phone call to get to the man. It's it's you know? good management, you know, and uh, it, you know one of the keys with, uh, you know, and I would say there's there's exceptions, especially in a big company. You don't want to be the guy that everybody calls first and bypasses all the sure. the tier, right? So uh, when somebody's really angry, they want to talk. Look, like, I don't want to, you know. So it's when. Hey, they, I don't want to talk to your sales rep. I don't want to talk to the manager. Right. I want to talk to my credits. Give them my number. And, you know, I'll get to the bottom of it. But if you're calling, call me every week. And something that could have been handled by the sales rep, right. they'll feel like I've just, you know, kind of neutered yeah, sure. my, you know, took, took power away from my, uh, my management team. So there's a point when you say, hey, of course. you know, come on, work this out with my sales rep or whatever. Good point. Um, but. You know, I think that the the sales team, you know, there was a, a guy who wrote a book once, you know, the customer comes second, you know, we say, oh, the customer comes first. And his point was, customer comes after you show that your your employees are taken care of. No company can survive or yeah. should survive with bad treatment of the employees. It shouldn't Agreed. happen. It does, but, you know, I don't want to, I didn't want to be that guy, you know? Yeah. And I always felt like, you know, I, I, <laughs> I had this dream at, 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 for a period of time, and I, I uh, we had a we had a uh, operations meeting, you know, and we we <laughs> came in there early, seven thirty in the morning, you know, and you see the driver slumped over, and you're <laughs> like, let me ask you something. I had this epiphany one day. We got all the drivers there. I said, it's this epiphany. So let me ask you this: When you got the job, did you come in <laughs> to the interview slumped over like that, or right. did we do this to you? You know. Was there ever a day when you were excited to show up? And I want to be not just 
if somebody says, do you work for Gretz Beer Company? I, I said, I don't want to be the guy that says, yeah, yeah, I work for him. I want to be, hell yeah, I work for him, yeah. Right, right. So we had the slogan, hell yeah. Used to drive my employees nuts. I said every, <laughs> every meeting, come on guys, give me any bit you want. Tell me anything we have to do. We'll work on it, I promise you. But at the end of the meeting, I want you to tell me, are you proud to work for this company? I want to hear hell yeah. Hell yeah. That lasted, right? Yeah. yeah. Hell, you proud? <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> well, after about a, a year, we had an employee survey and one of the things I heard more than once was, could we please ditch the hell yeah? <laughs> <laughs> that was the last we did it. Yeah, but funny. I think the point is that it is something, there is a uh, you know a feeling among employees when they're proud to work for a company and say, yeah. hey, this, this is a good owner. Treat us well, um, care about us, um, and it's a tough, tough business. You know, physical. Uh, people are beat down in the summer, cold. Yeah, they, going out in the snow. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really tough. So, I love those guys. I I miss them. I miss PJ. I miss yeah, you. I yeah. wish I could uh, be out hanging at the bar someday, like old, someday like old soon. Times. So that brings us to I, I think a good, good a good point. So what's next for Mike Retz? <laughs> Uh, you know, I would love to um, see a next, you know, the fifth generation get, I mean, my nephew is a brewer up at Vault. Uh, Kyler is head brewmaster at Vault Brewing, doing great work up Where, there. Where's Vault at? I Vault heard. is up in Newtown. Oh, uh, right, right, right. Okay. Newtown, uh, PA. Uh, great, very talented. Uh, my son is a master brewer. Uh, he's awesome. working, in, he's actually in a, working for Omega Yeast out in Chicago. So he's actually brewing every day with different wow. yeast strains. So these are really two talented uh, Gretz, uh, next gen, fifth generation Gretz people. And I'd hate to, you know, go to my grave not seeing that there is something, you know, uh, brewing or, or otherwise uh, back in the in the Philly area with beer. Um, you know, and, and whether that happens or not, I, I would love to see it happen. But as I tell them, it, you, you, you have to tell me what's relevant. It's like. You know, you guys are businessmen. You know, if you if somebody asked you what's the relevance of your of your business, yep. within a within a sentence or two, you're going to identify why you're in business and why you're doing well, right? Yep. So I tell them, and look, if if we ever do this, you better be able to tell me in one or two sentences what it is. It's going to make you different from the three thousand other brewers in the country that think they're all making the best beer in the world. You know, so tell me that and have me buy in and there would be nothing better than these two really talented brewers being back in bringing the legacy of a Gretz, uh, Gretz name back to brewing would be awesome it's their life though not mine and sure, you know sure. all I can do is hope for for something that that uh, takes it to that level we'll see excellent well really great time yeah, thank man. you so much for coming in we'll hope you uh, you come visit us again soon and let us know how you're doing Let's go have a beer. <laughs> Sounds good. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, great, great time.